Hello, everyone, and welcome to Indige Digital Summit 2022. Thank you all for joining us today. I am Ram Yeliswarapu. I am the Senior Vice President at Indigene, and I head the Indigene Clinical Business. Uh, we have an exciting panel session uh, today organized for you, and the topic is going beyond the keywords. What exactly goes into recruiting and engaging patients digitally? And so clearly, I think this is a very heavy topic. No one can deny the fact that drug development is a challenging process. Statistics tell us that one out of every 10 drugs that go into the pipeline for development successfully gain market access. And statistics also tell us that typical rate limiting factors are site selection, site activation, screening and enrollment. Typically getting past these hurdles is when good quality trial data can be captured, processed, analyzed, reported, and perhaps that could gain an approval. Over the last few years, on the back of the pandemic, we have increasingly started using digital transformation technologies and techniques. Uh, we started increasingly talking about patient centricity. Should it be a trial by trial approach or should it be a portfolio approach? What essentially are the insights we're gleaning from patients and how do we connect the dots from clinical development to the commercial launch? How do we engage with these patients? during the development timeline as well as in the post-approval launch phase of things. Joining me today to talk about all these and much more are a very interesting set of executives from the industry. We have representation from large pharma, academic research and private public consortium and also from some biotech companies. With that, let me introduce our esteemed panelists here. Christine. Hi. Hi, Ram. This is uh, Christina Duran from AstraZeneca. I'm the Chief Digital Health Officer in R&D. And, um, you know, it's great to be here to uh, share some of the things that we've been doing at AstraZeneca. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Dr. Ashish Atreja. Hi, I'm, uh, this is Ashish Atreja. I'm a CIO and Chief Digital Health Officer at UC Davis Health. And prior to that, I was Chief Innovation Officer at Malsana Health System engaging in digital technologies. So uh, really excited to share the work uh, and learn uh, from all of you. Thank you, Ashish. Farrell? Hey, Ram. Uh, thank you. Farrell Simons, I'm Senior Vice President, Trevi Therapeutics and Emerging Biotech. Thanks, Farrell. And then Nakul. Hey, Ram. Um, Nakul Vyas. Um, I lead the data analytics and innovation for Arcutis Biotherapeutics. Thank you all again. Greatly appreciate uh, your time. And I'm sure our audience is going to really have a wonderful time listening to the insights. Uh, and, and, and if you're able to share your experiences as we go along, that would be amazing. So let me kick it off by actually getting to a point. Maybe Christina will get started with you. Um, just looking at the portfolio of AstraZeneca, you would only assume that, you know, you have local trials, regional, global trials. You obviously have lots of franchises, lots of indications of interest and multiple phases of studies. Where exactly do you see the aspects of engaging, recruiting and engaging with patients in a digital manner, Christina, uh, working for you at this point in time with the experience that you've had thus far? If you could share some insights, that would be very helpful. Thank you. No, thank you. So um, it's been a journey. So we started um, before the pandemic and uh, we worked uh, initially with uh, patients and sites to get feedbacks in terms of recruitment and uh, also being participating in a clinical trial and getting their experience. Um, we got obviously a, a lot of feedback in terms of that experience and we also reviewed how much of that could be changed with new technology. Um, and we learned that uh, probably 70% of data that we were collecting in AstraZeneca historically, over 100 studies, could be collected from home, 70% with new clinical validated devices. Uh, we've been moving in that journey and uh, we had quite a big ambition, um, but obviously it got accelerated with the pandemic to review 90% of new studies for phase three. Um, to review uh, with a digital health strategy what, what could be the opportunities uh, in order to make that study better for patients from a patient experience, but also um, lower the cost and accelerate the timelines. So at AstraZeneca now, 
Um, from last year, we had the goal to review that 90% of the studies, and we do do it. It ends up being reviewing across the 100% of phase three studies that covers all therapeutic areas, so from oncology, cardiovascular, respiratory, rare, and um, uh, vaccines. But also, um, in terms of geography, we do run clinical trials in probably around 40 countries. Um, and about 20% of the studies come from the US. So many solutions that we, we saw uh, before the pandemic were, were very US centric. So we had to review solutions that worked across many geographies, including US, but also Europe, China, and Japan. So it's quite broad, but it can be done. So uh, we're, we're doing it. So <laughs> I hope it motivates other pharma companies to also focus on, on patients, on that patient centricity and make it so much better for patients and sites. Christina, thank you so much. That's amazing. And, and obviously the size and scale of AstraZeneca and the focus in so many indications that you're pursuing clearly has the statistics and your experience, if you will, over the last few years uh, in a very broad manner. Let me switch over to Farrell. Uh, Farrell, I know that uh, Trevi has a focus on a few indications. What's your perspective when, for example, you look at the indications of interest, you look at the various phases of trials, and perhaps uh, Christina's experience of the number of uh, countries and the ratio with which they pursue uh, US versus rest of the world. What's your perspective, Farrell? What's been your experience like? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we're, Christine and I are, are very focused on the same outcome, it's, it's patients. Um, you know, when you, when you look at, I sit in a commercial and strategy role here at Trevi, but we're a small company. So I work very closely with our clinical operations group. I think one of the big differences that we have is the importance of clinical trial recruitment and the importance of the speed of that in order to help us achieve our timelines, right? We don't, if we slip on timelines, uh, there's cash implications and cash burn implications. Uh, the financing market is challenging right now. So it has some broader uh, implications for us, but we always go back to the patient. We look at the patient insight. We are in two indications, one in dermatology, one in respiratory. And we try to look at it and we've, we've kind of started talking about instead of the patient journey, what is the participant journey? And how do you look at it from not just the patient angle, but also from the site angle in how to simplify the operations so that these are trials that patients want to participate in, but also can easily engage in and see the benefits of giving back to the scientific community. Amazing. Thank you, Farrell. Uh, Nakul, if I might just switch over to you very quickly. I know that um, Arcutis is very clearly focused on dermatology indications. Uh, again, you know, just reflecting on what Christina said and Farrell said, anything you'd like to share, your perspective and experiences, please. With uh, yeah, the Definitely, definitely. I, I think we are still playing in the U.S. North America sector at this point of time. But what you've seen is one of the trials without getting into the details of the indication we went for dermatology. Uh, we were able to recruit patients from Poland and complete one of our studies. Again, that goes back to the digital platforms that we have built. And to Farrell's point, we are looking at the journey, not just the patient uh, or the CRO alone. We are looking at the journey where, uh, you know, patient recruitment is based on real world evidence. Uh, we are going beyond the legacy real world evidence that we collect on claim data. So that's helping us target the right patients. And uh, the second principle that we applied is we took all the digital marketing capabilities. So why should we just limit the digital marketing capabilities to the commercial side? We applied those principles back on the clinical recruitment side. And uh, and the third one to what Farrell added is we were empathetic to sites as to what's the capacity at which they run and how do we kind of uh, enable them to be more uh, data driven and data capture driven versus, uh, you know, considering this as a day to day task. So I think a couple of factors there. Uh, where, you know, I think we are probably slipping into the decentralization part also, but I think uh, what has helped us is that applying the principles of commercial digital marketing strategies with real world evidence and being empathetic to the sites has uh, driven a lot of, uh, you know, value for our, some of our trials. Thank you, Nakul. And Ashish, I know that, um, you know, it goes beyond GI where you may have a certain focus, but you are such a huge proponent, Ashish, of use of digital technologies um, and, and then again, when you look at a complex therapeutic area like oncology, right, you know, can the aspect of uh, recruiting and retaining and engaging patients be looked at differently? And so from your point of view, Ashish, what's been your experience as you cut across, let's say, beyond 
uh, a smaller range of indications and cut across a wider range. Absolutely. Um, in my role at SANA, I am now at Health. Um, part of my role is to support the researchers uh, across uh, US Health. And at UC Davis Health, uh, our UC system, actually, in fact, we're one legal entity with five other health systems where 10% of all NIH money come. So 10% of all NIH productivity is from UC system. Um, and 50% of transplants happen here. 50% of money in California and research happens in UC system. So it's a very big research enterprise if you combine UCSF, UC, UCSD, uh, UC Davis, and UC Irvine. Uh, so I think part of it is how do we completely change the game? I think Farrell mentioned about site burden. Um, you know, as I started supporting trials at Mount Sinai around 10 years ago, I just can't believe the processes are, how would I say, the process completely be changed. Yeah, it's, I would not say it's an incremental change. I would say a new technology can have a frame shift change uh, and efficiency is not only for patients, but also for sites. I call it like a, unlocking the space and time dimension, right? So typical clinical trial recruitment happens when a, uh, and, uh, our coordinator needs to be in the same space as the, and at the same time. And the participants will come at their time of the indication, once in six months, once in three months, once in a year, right? You have to lock them at that place. So, so that becomes really a big challenge. Now, with, if you are able to engage digitally, you unlock both space and time dimension. You can engage patients through thousands of patients at once. So I'll share some of our work during COVID and post COVID. Uh, and I think that has been an eye opener for us, how fundamentally there can be a change in how we approach patients and really them um, and also decrease the burden on the site. Thanks Ashish, that's just an amazing thing, right? The way you phrased it is um, going digital has actually allowed us to gain more space, if you will, across the space and time dimensions, more of a, a leeway, if you will, to kind of leverage all of the power of space and time. And the fact that patients could be geographically distributed, be not necessarily constrained by some of those things. Um, and if I kind of uh, quickly switch over to, for example, the next topic I wanted to just quickly poll you folks is, uh, Indigen has a consulting arm called DT Consulting. Over the last few years, we've been running these surveys uh, very effectively, and uh, it's almost like an N equal to 100 uh, kind of a, a sampling, if you, if, you, if you would, that we con contacted research sites around the world. And uh, some of these questions that we posed have yielded these results. I wanted to just put this up just so that everybody could uh, get a chance to look at it. Um, so what you can see on the left-hand side on these bars is from Feb 2021 to let's say Feb 2022, um, there's been a marked improvement in terms of digital technology adoption from 57% going up to 81%. While there's perhaps no surprise in here that we see that on the back of the pandemic, sites have adopted digital technologies for sure. The same respondents actually told us that the ability of them to convince the patients to switch to digital and digital technologies uh, was a little bit not to, up to the mark as to what they would have expected. In other words, it can fell short of their expectations of the switchover of patients to digital technologies. So clearly, I think there's a need for the right tools. The funding support has to exist. Training has to be accompanied alongside. Maybe I'll start off with probably Dr. Ashish uh, this time, just to kind of see if you could show us or at least talk to us a little bit about your experience in terms of digital technology adoption by patients. How has it been measured? What was rolled out, so on and so forth, Ashish, should be helpful. Yeah, happy to. And I think uh, one of the biggest learnings we had is we, we not only the technology part, which is very important, the usability of it uh, and what we are presenting, but we a great way of measuring patient motivation, right? So part of it is, you know, patients may be completely different motivated to be partic participating in one trial versus other. And I'll give two examples kind of angry. Um, one is if you can um, show us, we, during COVID times, uh, we were right in the middle of the pandemic in New York City, and we were getting so many patients about what to do if they get COVID. This is just the, the earliest phase of the COVID. Um, and we actually jam-packed phone calls. We could not entertain any more phone calls because we were pretty at Sanai. So we had to actually get our medical students to take the calls, and we ran over all our medical students. So we had to set up a bot. So 
So patients can approach us and the ward can answer questions. And if they want, we can enroll them into a monitoring program. There was such a big need. So, so when we actually using prescribing the bot to 1 million patients, 55,000 people already enrolled them within four weeks uh, without a single coordinator, right? This would have taken us around, you know, 100 coordinators to enroll over a three month period. We were able to do completely automated because of the demand of the patients. And what we did was we created a very easy text to enroll program. Patient can just text a number and the bot will come or we were able to prescribe them right from the EMR electronic medical record so it landed into the patient portal and their form so pretty big success and we were just amazed like how fast we can just completely gain you know change the game in terms of men but because the patients uh, first were really really motivated and secondly there was no component of testing the patient from a lab test or examining the patient it was completely remote so it's easy to do at a distance in that regard but now we took that framework and we say, can we take into a real world application in a real clinical trial? So if you go to the next screen, um, we have a UO1 initiative, um, um, NIH UO1 with Cleveland Clinic, Northwest and uh, Mount Sinai and UC Davis Health around IBD. Um, and we have taken the framework and actually now prescribing patients uh, are also putting on the, you know, on the page of the website for the sites, how they enroll. And we got approval uh, with the central IRB across the sites. So without a e with an e-consent, without an in-person uh, maneuver, we can actually enroll patients directly from home and follow them electronic patient reported outcomes. But because this is not COVID and it's a, it's a disease which is IBD, the adoption is much more different. The process was, because it was COVID, the IRB fast-tracked everything with a week. And here, the, the usual processes which, which really impede a clinical trial enrollment in a health system, we're right facing those challenges. So it's the same technology, in fact, better technology. The use case is different, and it's post-pandemic phase. So we're getting back to some of those friction factors we typically see the site burden factors. So we've been able to enroll now uh, 78 patients over two months, uh, which is still faster than any other thing we would have done. Uh, and we are hoping to enroll around 500 patients. Uh, but just showing the, it's not the technology alone, it's the indication and the patients, but also the site burden and the site processes that limits their option in that regard. Uh, Brilliant. But Thank you so much. Just to close, you know, the patients were super happy. They, they said the best part of actually taking, participating in is enrolling seamlessly into clinical trial. So we do get benefit from the patient, but it's other burdens which limits us. Very well said. Thank you so much for sharing these learnings, uh, Ashish. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, Farrell, let me switch over to you. Again, you, you, you mentioned about, obviously, the focus being respiratory and dermatology. Um, the fact that earlier I presented some statistics about sites having a success in terms of digital technology adoption, patients may not be you know, following through alongside and to what Ashish just presented a COVID example or a use case as well as an IBD. What's been your experience in terms of the patient populations you're dealing with, uh, Farrell, uh, and, and their adoption of digital tech? What's your perspective, please? Yeah, so I, I think it gets back to personalization. You really have to look at the, the demographics of the patients in which you're looking to, to search, right? And so we have two very different demographics. Uh, we're in one indication in nodularis, the dermatology indication, which is a younger demographic. And therefore, we have less concerns about maybe some of the patient reported outcome measures, uh, you know, outreach being occurred on mobile devices. In our idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and chronic cough trial, this is a much older demographic. The average age is about 70 to 75. And therefore, we're looking at what is the right digital tool. Do we not use a mobile device versus an iPad when we look at trials, but also through clinical trial recruitment, making sure that I think Nicole, as you, as you nicely said, using the commercial vehicles in the clinical trial setting and recruitment setting, but making sure they're personalized and appropriate for that demographic. It gets down into something just even as simple as font size sometimes so that they can appropriately read, understand and comprehend the information uh, in order to advance with recruitment. Thanks, Farrell. And so, Nicole, 
Um, again, your focus on indications within dermatology. What's been your experience in terms of patients responding favorably to adoption of digital technologies, please? I think uh, we had mixed experience, but we learned from the first iterative way. One, number one, is, uh, as Farrell told, segmentation is critical. Knowing your patient, knowing where they come from, what's their background, what's their behavioral patterns, absolutely important. Um, so we did the segmentation and once we do the segmentation rightfully, I think we are able to reach them at the right point of contact. Right Now, the second part of the journey where it became much more interesting for us is uh, it's beyond segmentation. When patient had some inquiries or had some questions, how quickly could they reach back to, um, you know, our agencies or CROs and that's where we instituted what Ashish was telling. It was, we started off with a chatbot program, though it was partially managed with virtual assistants as well as people on the phone. But uh, I think it was based on the digital capability and savviness of the patient. Once they got recruited, they had a few questions to which, you know, sometimes we channelized through chatbot. Sometimes we went through, you know, a physical person answering the call, but I think, it goes back to segmentation ultimately. Can a person follow the instructions quickly through a digital mode? The other important aspect, keeping all these segmentation and digital capabilities aside, I think there is a touch of social element that also played in favor of us is because we started building communities much ahead of our phase two, phase three clinical trials, which actually, I mean, I can talk openly about it. It's aboric dermatitis. It's was no community for them. So building a community and then making and building a lot of awareness uh, of, of what are the possibilities, what are the resources available, I think that also helps. Uh, so it's, 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 it's different facets, but I would begin with segmentation and then look at where do you kind of begin your journey with uh, based on the age group or based on the digital savvy. Uh Great. That's amazing, uh, Nakul. Thank you for sharing that. So Christina, over to you. Um, given what we just heard, right, it's obviously very important to study the patient demographics, the segmentation that Farrell and Nakul talked about, uh, the aspect of leveraging real world data, and then using the insights from that to be able to design better so that ultimately the engagement or the quality of engagement with patients. And, and, and I also heard one other thing, which is create the communities and just leverage the tools and techniques on the that, that would be typically utilized in the commercial phase to try to personalize those in some ways or customize those for R&D experience, if you will. So a question for you is, obviously clinical trials have been ongoing for a long time. There are an incumbent set of vendors and CROs that have been steadily doing this work for a long time. Given all these extra capabilities required, technology, services, shift in the mindset, Christina, what's been your experience have you had the requirement, if you will, to supplement your incumbent vendors with some newer set of vendors? How do you look at that stuff and how have you been progressing on that front? Yeah, so um, so there, there is obviously a, a huge number of suppliers, um, both um, in terms of uh, uh, to support a clinical trial in a traditional way, but also in a, and it's linking to some of the data that you had on your previous slides, there is plenty of digital solutions to support a clinical trial separately. So you could have uh, devices that support that data collection from home or e-consent availability or a PRO electronic. Now, if you if you do it in a separate way, then the experience from a patient perspective and from a site perspective is dreadful. <laughs> and that's why you probably got the feedback that you're getting, you know, that yes, they're using more digital tools, but it's not better. It's not, it's more complex or they're not seeing that experience improving, et cetera. So what we are doing at AstraZeneca is looking at, you know, if you really want to improve that patient experience and that site experience, how do you unify that experience into one? So you don't end up with a suitcase of digital devices to the patient. Here you are, you're in the clinical trial. You've, you sort it all, all yourself with five apps for these devices and another app for here. So it's just unifying that experience. So we've been working not only with the different suppliers, but also to develop uh, solutions. So for a, one clinical trial, there is one app for the patient that unifies that experience for the patient. Which visits do they need to do? What's going to be done in the visit? Would that be at home or at the site? If they have a device, it's not a separate app, it's a 
also connected to the same. So they don't need to work out for each of the devices or each of the solutions, a different mechanism. So it's all unified into one. If they have to provide symptoms again, it's in the same solution. And it's all connected in terms of the assessments that ha they have to be done through the clinical trial. So yes, there is lots of different suppliers and different people that need to be involved, but it's how do you connect it all together so you can improve that experience. Now that takes, obviously, um, we don't, we now, have a, a solution that works uh, hopefully by the end of the year in 40 countries. Um, so we are already in 31. So uh, we're, we're obviously making sure that it, it does work in terms of unifying that experience, whether it's in China or the US, and it's obviously you need to get, it's, it's very different data reg regulation depending on which country you, you have to be based. But actually the feedback that we get from patients participating in clinical trials, regardless of the country, is very, very simple. So you find that experience and making it simple is that is what it creates the, the additional value so you don't need to do all the engagement of patients to join and then they drop out because it's a terrible experience is how do you engage them to come in and stay in because it's just so easy to participate um, as well um, so I would say it's both it's obviously working with many different parties but also how do you unify it from an experience perspective as well Brilliant, Christina. Thank you. So clearly it's not a one size fits all mechanism, right? Every experience, every indication, every interaction is valuable. And so Ashish, over to you, you mentioned something about obviously reducing the burden on sites. Obviously we're not just talking about patient centricity, but site centricity. And Christina talked about bringing down the number of tools and technologies, perhaps giving, making it easier and simpler, if you will, for patients to use tools to be able to engage better. Same thing with sites as well. Um, given the volume of work that you've been in, engaged in, Ashish, what's been your experience, you know, in terms of what Christina said, compare and contrast? No, it's, it's amazing. And Christina, we should be talking because um, we, we have this mission of converting UC into a digital and data first organization, right? Um, and there's this concept of digital front door, uh, which is basically in the clinical world that you want to, or in the consumer space, you want to... Uh, amazing experiences on a digital side, but they all connected together, right? So we can allow the person from one point of contact to others. So we are we are working on a completely a unified, we call it a digital Davis platform. We can enable unified journeys of patients across different service lines on the clinical side. And the same toolkit we are now using from the research side, because I see the, the clinical and the research side as two sides of the same coin. You just change the logic and you are able to guide them through a research journey with the automation built in. Uh, one of the things uh, that's very central to us is integration with electronic medical record. So, so I work with ONC on saying how we can actually enable Firebase API intersection, right? So we can automatically screen the right kind of patients or use NLP to find them and then engage them of the interest in, you know, in the party special. So there's something we can do by mapping to the enrollment criteria with the labs, the medications, physician notes, um, and kind of enroll them. Uh, I do feel it's a journey. Uh, uh, because of the size of it enormously, you can't conquer the entire space. So our approach has been, what are the, the touch points we, can, we want to give for everyone, every patient? And then how do we work with every single service line or speciality now to go deeper? So having a horizontal platform approach completely cloud-based uh, with the data connection to Databricks as a, as a unified layer, going deeper per service line, which is kind of similar, if I can say, from AstraZeneca, thinking of a platform and then having clinical trial uh, and having the experiences in every clinical trial separately and, and being very uh, rigorous about it. Thanks, Ashish. So, Nakul uh, Farrell, over to you both. Uh, maybe we'll start off with Nakul. So I think you heard Christina talk about obviously a larger portfolio um, and trying to really understand giving this uh, very unique experience, right? Touching both patients and sites, keeping it simpler, rolling it out, learning the lessons learned. She talked about uh, 31 countries uh, against a 40 country target into which they're rolling out. So a lot of lessons learned and I'm sure they can scale on the back of it. But given the portfolio of your respective companies and the focus, um, how do you view this? For example, it starts small. Do you think that you are much more nimble and agile to be able to take this, the digital shift, if you will, and bring in those efficiencies and effectiveness much faster in an organization of the size of yours? What's your perspective, Nako? Yeah, I think uh, 
Yes, definitely, right? I think uh, because we are starting small and focused in probably two or three uh, indications, the opportunity lies in how agile we can be. But I think there is a legacy trust factor too that needs to be kind of won over with, with this digital. So we have a team that is experienced on average, it is 35 years of experience in the clinical space. Uh, uh, and then, you know, the kind of sites that we we have to kind of go after is uh, beyond the US as well. So I think what we have learned, especially for the second indication trial that's going on, is that using digital capability is good, but I would take inspiration from what Christina told us, is how do you bring that seamless journey between a patient and the site? And how do you remove those roadblocks between sites and the patients? And for that, you know, taking inspiration from <clears throat> what Ashish told, we had, uh, you know, tried out still in the experimentation phase. We have tried out, uh, uh, I, I call it as uh, automatic data capture mechanism where sites don't have to spend time recording, uh, you know, all those evidences. Uh, there is a there is a way we have templatized few things with the sites so that they fill in few things and the data gets automatically captured in a central repository <clears throat> and uh, we're experimenting few api based approaches as well so i think we have that uh, you know advantage of experimenting which is where i think there are success and failures to it i'm not going into all the details of it but my point is uh, definitely an advantage because from learnings of our first indication we are now able to accelerate our second indication and probably that's what we're going to apply for the third and fourth that is that is in pipeline. So I definitely see a platform approach. The challenge, I think, which I'm not going to solve it today is how does sites who are kind of, you know, recruiting multiple indications adapt to this platform when, when multiple manufacturers, multiple sponsors approach them uh, is yet to be uh, broken out. And I, I'm hoping some, some blockchain kind of capabilities help us there. But I'll leave it with that thought. Awesome, Nakul. Thank you so much. I think um, clearly, I think uh, there's a lot of lessons learned. What's kind of standing out to me as a common theme is these lessons learned by companies, whether it is a biotech with a smaller focus and a pipeline versus the very large organizations. I think the lessons learned can perhaps be leveraged very effectively by the industry as a whole uh, without losing the competitive advantage, by the way. So we all can have our nuances and our proprietary IP, et cetera. But these common broad themes that are emerging in terms of lessons learned, I think it's be, it'll be a valuable exercise if the industry could come together perhaps and carve it out and try to kind of uh, spread that that uh, intelligence, if you will, that they've gained over the years. Um, Farrell, let me switch to you very quickly. I know that you are kind of certainly have a commercial strategy in mind at Trevi. You're also perhaps the change agent, if you will, in trying to kind of shift towards digital and saying, let's engage with the patients upfront. Let's move left to where we are and let's kind of uh, look at the value chain and engage with patients more effectively in R&D. Um, just connecting the dots between R&D to commercial, gleaning the insights from patients, whichever uh, you know phase they are in for, by the, by, by, for, for that matter. Uh, but, but clearly, what sort of a change management exercise are you experiencing, Farrell? Um, is it challenging? Uh, is it easy to convince, for example, other departments and units within the organization to come on board? What's been your experience? Yeah, it. I mean, we we made a great change at Trevia. I've been here two years, and I think we've we've grown by leaps and bounds. And part of that is just the collaboration internally that we've been able to to foster. And when we go back to what is the change management that we try to evoke as as I came in, is take really take that commercial experience and drive it into clinical operations, but that is that's not just doing things digitally and it's not just designing things digitally and then and, and switching things into a digital environment it's talking to patients helping them co-create uh what what is best for them that's who we're trying to serve and so by learning from them getting true insights we're able to design a more personalized more meaningful experience for them i think when we look at how do we change digital and digital and clinical operations and how we've done it it goes back to the test and learn and fail fast principles that i think everybody has has learned over the years right and progressed we do something we make sure that there are measurable metrics in which we can measure ourselves against and when we adapt and change we change fast and i think that's a, a nice nimbleness that we have at trevi and that we're able to employ in our future studies the one, the one thing, Ram, that I will say that is unique about other emerging biotechs 
When you get earlier in the development cycle, you normally don't have commercial on board by that point. And so there's a unique dynamic that goes on that clinical operations uh, don't necessarily have the benefit of having that commercial insight or the, com the commercial way of thinking. And so I think that that's a gap that needs to be filled within emerging biotech. Great. No, thank you so much, uh, Farrell. Um, I, was, I guess I would say that if uh, any of you have any closing thoughts for this session, what we'll do now is probably switch over to the questions from our audience. But before I do that, uh, Christina, anything that you would like to kind of add to what you heard thus far? No, I think we are, we are, we are all bit aligned in terms of what we've heard uh, in terms of the importance to listen to patients, and I totally agree with Farrell, it's not just uh, digitizing the process, it's making sure that you, you involve the patient, uh, not only on the problems that they face, you not only involve them in the solution, we actually test the solutions with them and make sure, you know, they gave us ideas, they develop it with us, they test it, <laughs> they tell us if it, does, it works, it doesn't work, so then we can, we can make it even better as it goes live. So um, it's just having that engagement all the way through. Um, from patients, so um, uh, that that patient experience and site, you know, to me is the is the core of what we're trying to to improve um, and make better. Yeah. Brilliant, Ashish. Anything from you before we switch over to Q and A? No, this this is this is great uh, discussion. I think um, because of it, it's not only what we do, but who is the person who patients trust, uh, hear from. So that's why we have found that the physicians who engage with their patients. Uh, they are able to recruit in that regard. Uh, one of the things we are uh, betting on is automation behind it. Once we know this is working, how do we automatically nudge the patient? Uh, how automatically get the data part? Uh, and how do we make it as an enterprise uh, capability? There's a uh, fascinating kind of development in that part. So I see both the experience part and the automation part kind of uh, allowing us to kind of uh, really double down on the outreach to the patients. Great. Thank you so much. So the first question from our audience, if I might just put it out there, and I'd like to see who would want to go against uh, or try to respond to this. Um, so basically, the question is, how do you measure success in this so-called digital transformation and the shift towards identifying, recruiting, and engaging patients in the digital world? How do you measure the ROI? How do you measure success? What sort of metrics or KPIs is your organization thinking about it? Anybody? I can start. Uh, um, no, we uh, we obviously a large organization in uh, in the stock market shareholders. So obviously having a benefit of anything that you do, it seems to be uh, uh, you know critical. I think the the, the beauty and that what we have seen and um, we're hoping to get a publication later on in the year is that it's a it's a win 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 in some of the measures. So as you try to improve um, patient experience. Um, to measure it by um, obviously initially in the design through indicators of service with patients and how much burden each of the procedures take um, to be able to quantify based on all the different assessments what would be the burden of the patient and then obviously asking patient how was the experience at the end. But as you improve patient experience seeing is that you can get a win-win-win in all the other measures. So if you eliminate a lot of the procedures physically you can also help to reduce the cost as you uh, collect a lot more data digitally in, in a more uh, regular basis. You don't need as many patients. You don't need as many physical visits. So you end up having the patient experience. You also get a lower cost. And we've seen some studies at 30% lower cost based on being able to remove quite a lot of inefficiencies. You also get an acceleration. So if you've got a digital biomarker, I was highlighting that where you don't need any patients because you're collecting a lot more data, you can also accelerate the study. If now you need 50% less patients, I can tell you that a study is going to run faster because you don't have 50% <laughs> more patients to recruit. So you end up with a win-win-win of better patient experience, lower cost, accelerated study, and actually it also helps to reduce the carbon emissions and not everybody's traveling all the all, all you know to the to this site as, as often as it used to. So it's a win-win-win. And that's how we measure it. How much is the patient experience, the timelines, the cost, and since this year also the carbon. Great, Christina. Thank you so much. Um, that's just uh, fabulous to understand that obviously we are collecting more data but leveraging and analyzing the data is allowing us to do better, perhaps with fewer resources, if I were to summarize uh, quickly as to uh, what you said. Uh, that's amazing. 
Um, so, so very quickly, Nakul, um, any thoughts on your uh, on this particular topic of saying what are the KPIs? How do you measure the ROI? What ultimately is success as defined by your enterprise? And are you measuring it at this point in time? Because that will lead to change in the organization, right? And the and the SOPs and so on and so forth. But any any thoughts? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, one of the things, and it's it's I am thinking it is uh, uh, you know some experimentation that we are doing. But adding on to what Christina told, I will not repeat some of the things. But one of the things that we are doing is we we are calling it as an experiment framework measurement. So basically, we are putting all the experiments that we are doing and putting an index of success and failure to it. So all the failures are also measured as good outcomes for us in terms of the digital experiments that we did. So that's one indicator that, so number of failed attempts and number of transformations that we do in the next iteration is one key metrics that we track in, in and we call it as clinical trial experimentation framework. Uh, but that's one thing which we track to see what are the learnings that we do to move from point A to point B. Uh, the other aspect which we are doing is, as, as she rightfully told, is biomarkers. But I think what we have done is we have kind of seamlessly merged with the commercial world where, you know, patient education adherence, uh, you know, evidence of that is taken from our clinical trial phases and vice versa. The adherence and uh, the biomarker results are passed on as phase four uh, to clinical trials and R&D. So I think... The biggest thing what I learn is, as part of this journey is, what's the loyalty and trust that we are building with patients, uh, be it from the clinical side or from the commercial side, because I think both the ends can lead to the right engagement if we do it the right way. So I think those are the two measures which I will add on is, one is an experimentation framework, uh, which indicates whether we are progressing in the right way. Another one is uh, patient loyalty or trust factor. Uh, now it's not a simple, a formula that you put and arrive at the uh, you know lifetime value of a patient. Uh, I'm not den denoting towards that. My point is, how are you using the learnings from clinical studies for better patient education and adherence and vice versa? How is the adherence and monitoring being used for uh, clinical for trials? Thanks, Nakul. So one more question, Ashish, maybe I'll just uh, direct this to you. Um, you know, the talk about digital tra transformation, um, the whole concept of should it be fully decentralized or should it be a hybrid or fully centralized, it all starts with the protocol. So the question is, where do you start for us to realize the complete value of the development pathway? Uh, shouldn't the protocol be constructed, which then means can the, shouldn't the inputs from the patients be incorporated right there? And that will lead to everything downstream to be designed and, and conducted in the proper manner. Any thoughts uh, in response to this question, Ashish? Yeah. No, absolutely. It's a great question. I'll briefly answer the, uh, the efficiency part and the ROI part and come to this. I think one of the most hidden part of ROI, at least from our site lens, is the coordinator burden, right? And and uh, so we need to address that as well. And, and you know, what we showed with the, with the COVID bot, we were able to have 100 coordinators work for 60 days, would have achieved the same outcome as we were able to do through automation. So I think that's a hidden bond. That's why sites are really very slow, because they can't recruit coordinators very fast. And the same coordinator is just doing inefficient processes. So just as we go forward, we need to keep that in mind. I think with this protocol, I would go even Ram one step further. Um, and uh, I was advising a few uh, kind of uh, a pharma in that regard. And there was a, we thought that even the protocol can be changed based on what is possible. So one part is to say this is the protocol and how you can go to a hybrid versus decentralized. The other part is as you start using more and more technologies, you can say even the protocol does not need these many visits in person. So, so I think even the ideation part of the protocol can completely get changed and you can actually let go many of the in-person visits and maybe have one at the start if examination is required, one at the end while the rest of it can be done through telehealth if there is a person that's required. So, um, and, then, and then some do not, you can't have fully decentralized trials. You have to have a component of physical, uh, sometimes during enrollment and sometimes for check in and that's okay. But I do believe, and I have, uh, what Christina was saying, if there's a lot of uh, technology stack and there's a lot of experience, you can envision a majority of the trials going route, if not completely with major efficiency, right? 
Yeah, Ashish, no, thank you so much. I, I just wanted to, as the clock's winding down, I must take a moment here very quickly to thank you all. Obviously, this is just the beginning of a, perhaps a much larger conversation. Um, I kind of sincerely appreciate you all taking the time to be on this panel session with me and the audience. Thank you for sharing great perspectives and insights for IDS 2022. And to our audience, stay tuned for the next session that's coming up. And by the way, this conversation will continue. So thank you all to the panelists on this session. Thank you.